Good evening, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight for our discussion of technical parole violations and how they contribute to mass incarceration in New York State. I am Greg Morrell, the chair of the New York City Bar Association's Committee on Corrections and Community Reentry. Tonight's topic is incredibly timely and important. Uh, as the pandemic continues to be deadly and rage across the United States and has spread particularly uncontrollably within prisons and jails across the United States, uh, thousands of people are incarcerated every day in New York State for technical parole violations. And these can be things that are as minor as missing a curfew or drinking a glass of wine without a parole officer's permission. All of this costs the taxpayers in New York State close to $700 million a year. It exacerbates the already extreme racial inequities in the criminal justice system. And it's extremely counterproductive towards the goal of allowing people to successfully re-enter society after being in prison, to pursue career opportunities, reunite with family members, education, seek out treatment. So we have quite a bit to discuss tonight and we have an excellent, excellent all-star panel and great moderator to help us do that. A couple notes for the audience. Um, we have the Q&A function open on Zoom as well as the chat function. Uh, if you have questions, please just use the Q&A function. You can put your questions in there throughout the event whenever they come to you. I'll be keeping an eye on those as Zachary moderates us. And then at the end of the program, towards the end of the program, I'll reappear on your screen and I will pose your questions to our panelists. I also wanted to thank my colleagues at the New York City Bar Association who are co-sponsoring this event, the Criminal Justice Operations Committee, as well as the Task Force on Mass Incarceration, and also our wonderful co-sponsoring organizations, the Justice Lab at Columbia University, the Catal Center for Equity, Health, and Justice, the Legal Aid Society, A Little Piece of Light, More Just NYC, and We Are Unchained. So our moderator tonight is Zachary Katz Nelson, who is the policy director of the Independent Commission on New York City Criminal Justice and Incarceration Reform, also known as the Littman Commission. He has almost 20 years experience investigating and achieving change in Rikers Island and jails and prisons across the United States. In addition, he has represented people on death row with the Equal Justice Initiative, men in Guantanamo Bay with the British charity Reprieve, and women convicted of killing their abusers with the California Habeas Project. He helped found and formerly co-chaired congregation Beth El Hamin's uh, racial justice team, which uses faith-based organizing to reform the criminal legal system. He's a longtime member of my committee at the New York City Bar Association, as well as the Task Force on Mass Incarceration. Zachary. Great. Thanks so much, Greg. It's a pleasure to be here. And thanks so much, everybody, for joining us tonight. Really a pleasure to be with you. And thanks so much to the panel as well for, for being here, giving of your time, and to the City Bar for helping us pull it all together. I just want to start by introducing our panel and then we'll jump into questions. And again, as Greg said, we're gonna have a chance for questions at the end from all of you. So please feel free to put those in the Q&A as we move along. Well, I'll start with Wesley Keynes. Uh, Wesley Keynes is the chief of staff of the Bronx Defenders. He leads the Bronx Defenders systemic reform efforts and oversees the policy impact litigation and community organizing teams there. Uh, before joining the Bronx Defenders, he worked at Brooklyn Defender Services where he launched a records accuracy project working with area law students to identify and correct rap sheets, uh, rap sheet errors. Uh, Mr. Kane is a graduate of Bard College and New York Theological Seminary. Laura Rosso is a staff attorney of the Legal Aid Society's Parole Revocation Defense Unit. Ms. Rosso is a graduate of NYU and Hofstra Law School. Uh, prior to joining Legal Aid, Laura was an attorney with the Center for Family Representation's Family Defense Practice in Queens and a law clerk to Judge Juan Merchant of the New York State Supreme Court in the criminal term. Um, Donna Hilton is president and founder of A Little Piece of Light, uh, an organization named after her memoir that helps women re-enter society after incarceration. Uh, Donna spent 27 years behind bars and several years on parole in New York State. Uh, while incarcerated, Donna earned a bachelor's degree in behavioral sciences and a master's degree in English. 
Uh, Vincent Chiraldi is co-director of the Justice Lab at Columbia University and senior research scientist at the Columbia School of Social Work. Uh, previously, he was director of juvenile corrections in Washington, D.C., commissioner of New York City Department of Probation, and senior policy advisor to the New York City Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice. He received a master's in social work from New York University and a bachelor's from Binghamton University. Dr. Vonner Seward is professor of criminal justice at Kingsborough Community College. Uh, she's retired from the New York, from the Brooklyn District Attorney's Office, where she spearheaded the County Reentry Task Force. And prior to working in the DA's office, she was the statewide director of reentry services for New York, the New York State Department of Corrections and Community Supervision, which runs parole. In this capacity, she was responsible for ensuring there were resources and services readily available for persons under parole supervision in New York. She has a PhD in criminal justice from Capella University. A Master of Science in Criminal Justice from Iona College and a BA from the College of New Rochelle. Kenyatta Thompson is Director of Organizing at the, the, excuse me, the Katal Center for Equity, Health and Justice. Uh, since joining Katal in 2018, Kenyatta has worked with members on issues including mass incarceration, drug policy and housing. Uh, prior to joining Katal, Kenyatta worked as a workforce developer at Roca Inc. where she worked, she, uh, well, she worked with workforce readiness groups for young people who are impacted by the justice system. She holds a Bachelor of Science in Psychology from Juniata College and a Master of Social Work from the University of Connecticut. And so welcome to all of you and thanks again for being here. Uh, Vinny, maybe I can start with you. Uh, can you tell us a bit about what parole is, what it's meant to achieve, and then a bit of how New York compares with, with other states in this country? Sure, and thanks for having me on. Thanks so much to the New York Bar, particularly New York City Bar for really championing this issue and staying on top of it. It's, uh, it's kind of forgotten in the field in some respects, community supervision, probation and parole. And it's great that the bar is kind of stuck with it like this. Um, we, uh, in New York State, we had, we started the first uh, parole process in the United States when Elmira Penitentiary was brand new in 1876. The new superintendent thought, that people should have an opportunity through you know, work inside prison and through uh, uh, participating in programs to get out earlier, but then that, uh, that early release would be conditioned upon their behavior in the community. But it was very much meant to be a helpful function when people came out. In fact, they were only on it for six months initially because they thought any longer would, would be too too impossible in the minds of the people trying to make it. And all the people that were supervising them were volunteers. So it's very clear it was meant to be a rehabilitative and helpful function. To be sure, you, it was always conditional and you could come back for misbehavior, but that was meant to be considered rare. Now that, that sort of opportunity to reincarcerate people for non-criminal rule violations of parole is eating the mission of community supervision. It used to be rare uh, when the leading decisions, a bunch of lawyers, I'm not, uh, Morrissey and Gagnon were handed down in 1972 and 1973. The entire prison population wasn't as large as as many people as we send to prison every year now just for technical violations. So there's no way the court could have ever anticipated that. Uh, when it handed down Gagnon and Morrissey. Um, and so now in New York State, we lock up more people than any other state in the country for non-criminal rule violations. Uh, and the research we put out from the lab and the Littman Commission today showed that that cost uh, $683 million in 2019. This is at a time, and, and, and uh, Dr. Stewart, Stewart can tell you more about this, this is at a time when there's not a lot of uh, resources and options to help people find housing, to help people find education, employment, mental health services, drug treatment. Uh, and yet we're finding $683 million a year to deprive people of their liberty for doing things like staying out past curfew, associating with somebody else with a criminal record and testing dirty for drugs. 
Thanks so much, Vinny. Uh, Dr. Seward, if we could turn to you, please. You know, for, for several years, you ran a central piece of New York's parole system, namely reentry services. Uh, can you tell us a bit about how, how the parole system operates today and what you believe needs to be changed? Well, I, I think for me, when we think about the whole reentry concept, because I was a statewide director for reentry services. So right away, you think about the necessary linkages and, and services that's necessary to reconnect an individual back into the community. And I think early on, um, when I first got to the department, you know, DCJS had a nice plan rolled out, you know, on paper as to how to begin to engage people when that process was supposed to start. And that process was supposed to start really at the time of the arrest and, and, and each time the person goes through the, the, the system um, of the um, incarceration and then preparing to be released and then you know parole, that they were more equipped to um, transition um, successfully. I think what I what I realized really quick was that there was some sort of resistance um, at some level with individuals wanting to abide by the, the change that came forth um, by then um, um, Denise O'Donnell, who was spearheading um, at that time um, the whole you know um, compass and in, in, in the transition plan. But what I also saw is that. It was so easy for somebody to get violated for something that could have been either resolved through mediation, resolved through um, some sort of you know treatment program that was properly matched to the individual that was under supervision. But you also saw where um, individuals' lives were disrupted because of something that may be my, you know, can be considered very minute um, and force them to get a, a violation and end up back in custody. And then what, what I would find is that maybe 30 days or even, you know, 90 days later, that same person that was hard to place or hard to engage in a service, my staff and myself now had to try to re-engage them um, and kind of like start the life all over again um, from day one. And, and in some cases, you had, you know, individuals who had just may have um, went through the family reunification process with their children. There is no one to take care of the children. So now the children are back into a system. And, and you know, so it was, it was just sort of speak a revolving door. And it just seemed as though nobody really wanted to listen to other ways to engage um, technical um, violations. And I think a lot of it has to do, as I've always um, said in many of my conversations, parole officers do what they're told to do. And they're also um, forced in so many ways to cover their behinds. Um, it's so much easier to do a technical violation and let a judge at the judicial center in the revocation process to let the person out than it is for the parole officer to try to work with the person in the community and then God forbid something happens and then it all falls on them. So I think that, you know, um, this is a, a real um, sensitive subject, but I think it's a subject that um, is long overdue. And I think if the taxpayers really knew where their um, tax dollars were going and how they were really being misled, I think that this whole um, concept of um, less is more would be more embraced by many. Thank you. Thank you. Kind of building from that, you know, Wes and Donna, you, you both were on parole for several years and you experienced this from, from that vantage point. I was wondering if you might be able to share a little bit about what that was like day to day, your interaction with parole officers, but also how did the system help or hinder your ability to, to rebuild your lives when you came home from prison? And maybe we'll start with Wes and then and move to Donna. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I don't think that it, it would be a surprise by anyone who's tuning into this panel to learn that our criminal legal system along its spectrum is very flawed in how we think and how we do the things that we do. That it plays out in the parole context the way that it does with people being violated, essentially for violating 
technical rules, not not having broken any any laws, is actually not surprising to me. Um, there is a disconnect. First of all, people stay incarcerated longer because there's a disconnect between what Vinny spoke about. The initial premise of parole in its inception was about rehabilitation and then allowing people who had demonstrated that they had taken responsibility for actions and were doing the work necessary to transform themselves to then have an opportunity to return to the community and continue that progress. And because of the disconnect between programming in prisons with commissioners who determine who gets released when, you find that people are being denied parole more frequently, especially if their offenses are, are violent in nature or sometimes violent in or categorization, right? And then now when they do eventually come home on parole, you have, it's literally a roll of a dice as to whether or not you will get a parole officer who sees themselves as someone who is supposed to aid and facilitate your re-entry back into community in a positive way versus a parole officer who sees themselves as being an extension of corrections on one side and policing on the other. Their, their job is literally to control your body and to control you because there's this dim view of human capacity to change. And, and with my experience, I, I had the overwhelming fortune of having my first parole officer who was assigned to me be someone who literally took the time, read my file, read about my case, read about my institutional record, and sat with me for over 90 minutes the first time we met and just spoke about the conditions on the which I found myself being arrested and incarcerated and what my vision was for my reentry. And with that, he was very diligent in making sure that he provided the opportunity for me to succeed. I probably would not be sitting here having this discussion with you had it not been for him being so open to the fact that the person who sat before them was redeemable. After two and a half years, this particular commissioner transferred to another jurisdiction. I then was assigned a second parole um, officer who kind of continued the same regime of the first parole officer. But then three months before my discharge from parole, I was assigned a parole officer who had such dim views of someone like me who was charged with what I was charged with and incarcerated for what I was incarcerated for, that it was literally the worst 90 days of my reentry, right? And I, I thought back on this many a times, what would have happened if this person was the initial parole officer I was assigned to and how different my reentry trajectory could have possibly been simply by the luck of the draw of who I was assigned when I came out of the correctional space. So on a day-to-day -day basis, I think parole officers have great power and great abilities to help parolees really re-enter and sometimes enter. Like the fact of the matter is I spoke about that spectrum of our criminal legal system. The vast majority of people in prison literally was set up to fail before many of them were out of like elementary school. That's just a fact. And if we're gonna talk about the things that enhances safety, which I hate pegging safety to the notion of any you know, legal system and any policing system, but if we're gonna talk about the things that makes communities thriving, then we need to talk about the, the, the defunding of the various institutions in the community that has really contributed the environmental factors that drives people into our criminal legal system to begin with. And I know the term defund as it relates to police is like a third rail that no one wants to touch right now, but there's not a lot of pushback when we think about all the other areas of our communal lives that have been defunded. Schools have been defunded. 
after school activities have been defunded. Uh, um, libraries have defu been defunded. Mental health services has been defunded. And while these spaces are defunded with, with little to no resistance from the privileged class, at the same time, the increase in resources to our punitive structures in society has just gone through the roof. So when we talk about over $600 million for reincarcerating people for technical violations, I think we really need to have an honest discussion about the people who are in this system and why it is we're okay with them being trapped there and having this cycle continue. Yeah, I um, yeah, I just piggybacking on on what Wes said. I mean, I I mirror that completely. Um, but I want to add that you know it's interesting that you know with this report, people are learning how much money could be saved, right? But how not just that, but how much money could be reinvested into the communities of the areas in which people are coming from, which are so under resourced. Like this didn't happen yesterday that these communities are under resourced. There's no uh, good uh, substance abuse programs or mental health programs and the like. This is just didn't happen yesterday. It's been going on for um, decades, right? We remember a time, I think some of us on this panel can remember a time back in the nineties when mental health facilities were shut down and the response became prison, right? Prison became the end all of the end all. Right. And so it just tied into what was going on in the 90s with the crime bill and so many other things. But I want to bring this story up front because it tells you a lot um, about what our walk is. And excuse me, I live next to a train. So uh, what our walk is daily. So how tender it is. Right. It's like walking on eggshells. I always say this, but I have a friend who's been three decades, over almost four decades in prison. And so she ha she's in a good um, job, has great employment, finally, finally, finally found housing after being out with three years, almost three years, right? Um, and really, I mean, exceptionally doing really, really well, right? She, I was there when her parole officer was handing her her, um, travel pass to travel because when you're on parole you need a travel pass to go to and from different parts of the state you know the union right um for your work or whatever understandably but the questions and the warnings that were given to her is mind-boggling because you have a woman who and she just became her new parole officer so you know they changed them periodically and so we're they're always flowing and so we never really can really maintain a relationship with one but that's understandable because they're so overwhelmed with so many people on parole that there needs to be a better way for them as well you know it, it, it's too much a caseload should not exceed I would say for parole it shouldn't exceed 50 people 30 people you know I mean they have hundreds of people and some of them on their caseloads and that's crazy but giving her the travel pass and, and, and the things that were told to her, you know, to make sure she doesn't do X, Y, and Z. And it was almost threatening. Like, you know, you can tell me anything. You better tell me anything that happens because if you don't tell me anything, it was like that imminent threat. You know, we talk about the imminent threat of danger. There was that imminent threat of just, you know, facing a violation. And so I watched her, you know, I watched my friend just kind of like, become afraid a little bit like, wait, what, what, what do you mean? Tell you what? I tell you everything, you know? And she had to become kind of put on the defense to be offensive, you know what I mean? To, to, to respond in an offensive way to like, what are you talking about? I tell you everything. I don't know what else I'm, I need to tell you. There's something I'm not telling you. And immediately, because there's that fear, there's that fear that we live with daily that no matter what we do or don't do could be seen as a reason to violate us and send us back to prison for not committing a crime. So if I didn't tell you something, you know, whatever that something may be, and I might not know what you're trying, you know, that something may be because you're not clear yourself. You know, you can make it anything that you want. It's arbitrary, just like when we're in prison. There's this, there are arbitrary rules and procedures and we can get, viol we can get um, written up for them and sent to solitary confinement or just keep locked, right? And so it's the same thing. 
So you don't know, you have to be careful to walk that line with a parole officer because you don't know what their rules are for you in that moment. And it, 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 it's, um, it's wrong, right? Let's call it what it is, it's wrong. But it also says a lot because how do we treat people like that? To Wes's point, after, um, you know, an exemplary record and coming out and working and, and immediately, you know, getting herself together or myself together is the same thing. I had the same um, situation almost as Wes, but one of the things is I had a good support team and I actually had some friends on the higher ups where I can just call and say, hey, because I didn't understand the rules so well because they kept changing with every parole officer what they meant. So what does this person mean? Because the last person who told me this it didn't sound like this and it wasn't presented in that way. So I don't understand Did something changed. So I had to have somebody on the outside tell me what the actual rules are and what they, what was meant by what was said to me. And so if I didn't have that support, who knows? And the reason why, because, you know, you come out, you have a certain crime, that's instant offense. We all know what those are, the instant offense that puts you away. And then you're always labeled as that you're always labeled and looked as such. And so no matter what, I mean, it, it made no sense for me to come out and I had no drug record, no anything like that. And that I had to always submit a drug test because that's just the rule. You're wasting money buying, giving, buying a drug kit for somebody who never had did drugs and always having to submit a drug test when it could be that money could be probably you know used doing something else, and instead of looking at things to um, want to uh, violate us for, why don't offer opportunities? They will have you checked this program. Have you? How are you? How are you doing? Right? How do you know about this program? Do you know about this? Do you know about that? I we didn't get that. A lot of people still don't get that. We do that for our um, peers. And we do that in the, in the organizations that we run and that we work in, right? We do that. But parole, to um, Vinny's point, was not created for that, right? It was supposed to be a system to help you once you step outside of the prison into society. But it's not doing that. It's not doing that. It is such a very punitive and very... Um, 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 trepidatious kind of system that we have in place where people don't know what to do any given day, especially with, depending on the parole officer. And so we need less is more. We need things like this in place so we can have some boundaries. We can have checks and balances. You have a clear understanding what it is you're supposed to be doing as a parole officer. And I have a clear understanding of what I should be doing as someone on parole. Very clear, concise, and concrete. And not just, I wake up tomorrow and you show up at my door with another rule. And if I violate it, I'm going back to prison and it's not a crime. It's something that you might feel today to say to me. Thank you, Tana. You know, Laura, you, you, you represent people day in and day out who are accused of violations of the rules of parole. Can, can you talk us through a little bit about what that process is like if a parole officer accuses somebody of a violation? What does it look like for that person? What, what, what are some typical violations or what are kind of the penalties people face and where are they during this violation process? Yes, yes. well, first, thank you so much for having me um, so that I can share my story and more importantly, my client's stories. Um, I think what a lot of people don't realize and I realize that many people on this call may be attorneys, um, and I didn't realize when I began this work and previously I'd worked in other jobs where I was in an actual court, is that not only is it difficult, almost impossible to be out on parole supervision, but once you are violated for really anything, um, you're mandatorily detained on that parole warrant and held in, in our client's case, anybody in New York City at Rikers Island for the pendency of your case. Um, there is no recognizance hearing, no bail, no matter what the violation is, no matter what your situation was in the community and how well you may have been doing. Um, once someone is violated, they'll go to, to Rikers Island and essentially just wait. Wait really without any information about what they may face. Um, a few days later, they, may be, they will be served with papers, um, their violation papers that give them 
the right to ask for a preliminary hearing or waive that hearing and go straight to what's called a final hearing. Uh, many clients in, inform myself and the attorneys that I work with that parole officers urge them and really pressure them to waive their right to a preliminary hearing, which would be their first chance to fight their case. Um, an, a real opportunity that parole would have to show some evidence to be able to hold a human being just on a violation of parole in jail. Um, these hearings pre-pandemic took place not in a court, but on Rikers Island in a complex of trailers. Um, these trailers are, in, in theory, I guess the hearings are open to the public, but the amount of bureaucratic hoops that someone would have to jump through to actually attend these hearings make them virtually closed to the public eye. Um, the hearings are in, in jail. I mean, my colleagues and I would attend these hearings. We would have 15 minutes with each client to interview them in tiny interview booths. Our clients in handcuffs would be paraded to these small um, courtrooms that are essentially conference rooms. They would be cuffed throughout the duration of their hearings in backless chairs that are bolted to the floor. Um, there have been cases where clients have told me their hands are numb because they're, they're cuffed for so long. Um, a client who was almost 68 years old remained cuffed for an entire almost three hour long hearing. The, so as I said, Parole is, is difficult and once someone comes into custody, um, the, the inhumanity is almost unimaginable that someone faces in, in the system. Um, right now, during the pandemic, most of our hearings are actually only happening over the phone. So a hearing that where someone's liberty really depends on them being heard and being seen and being able to face who is accusing them is happening over the phone. People are being sent back to jail and state prison over the phone. There have been a handful of hearings that have been um, over video. As of March 1st, um, Doc said that they would finally utilize video hearings, but that has been incredibly sparse. Um, so the amount of real inhumanity to the core that people face when they come to, into custody is unimaginable. And as attorneys, I think that, and, and it really anyone in society, I think they would be horrified to learn what the actual process is that our clients face once they come into custody. Um, I mean, if you can imagine and personally put yourself in a situation where you're incarcerated on a violation, um, you have no say about whether or not you go back to jail, your parole officer puts on the cuffs, cuffs, brings you back to jail, and you just wait. You don't know who your attorney is. You don't know what judge you're going to go in front of. You don't know when you're gonna go in front of a judge. And when you finally do appear, it's to pick up a phone and just talk into the abyss, not know who you're talking to. The people who are on the other line of the phone don't know who you are. Um, and when you do speak up and try to say something, you're told to be quiet because your attorney will speak for you. Um, so, so really just the amount of procedural injustice that people face when they come into the system is, is unimaginable. Um, I, I, I very much hope that with reform that these hearings, if parole is going to exist and if the violation process is going to exist, these hearings need to, at the very least, take place in, in the community where people can see them um, and where people can, and people on parole can be given the opportunity to at least argue for their recognizance. Um, so that, that is some, somewhat of what the system looks like now, at least in New York City. Thank you. Just, just to follow up briefly about that, can you say what, what's the standard of proof that has to be met to send someone back to prison for a violation? And who's actually making the decision about that? Sure. So the, the standard of proof um, to sustain a violation is a preponderance of the evidence. Um, I mean, that's a, a low standard as, as anyone knows, it's um, that uh, it's more likely than not that someone violated. Um, so it is very difficult to advise clients on really the risk of going forward to fighting their case at a contested hearing, which is like a trial because the, the standard of proof is so low. Um, and under less is more, um, it's my understanding that the standard of proof, at least for the final hearing phase would be raised to clear and convincing evidence and the, at the preliminary hearing, it would be um, a preponderance of the evidence. In terms of some of the sanctions that our clients face, um, and we are counseling clients on 
um, you know, minimum time assessments of 12 months, um, any number of months for, for time assessments, really, it's, it's incredibly difficult to, to fight for what's called a revoke and restore, meaning a client would plead guilty to a, to a certain charge in exchange for being restored to community supervision. Um, sometimes it is when, when a client will appear for the first time at their final hearing, you know, they may be um, a, a month into their incarceration. If, if a plea is offered that will get them out and, it, and they're pleading guilty to something, um, they're not really thinking about the sustained violation on their record because that's getting them out. Um, and then there's this whole record of, of how many people are violating parole when really these violations could be total nonsense. But really just as, as the criminal justice system um, and the legislature recently realized in bail reform, people are pleading guilty to get out of jail. And that's what's happening now in New York State with parole reform. Um, it's really unconscionable some of the, the, the amount of time that people face and that there's really no limit on it. If somebody has, for instance, two prior sustained violations, which I can tell you is incredibly, if you have five years post-release supervision, it can be incredibly easy to accrue, say, two prior sustained violations. Um, if someone had that on their record, and they violate it again, they could be subject to being held up to their maximum. There's really no cap on that. There's just so much discretion in the sentencing pro process. Um, the, um, in terms of who makes the decision of whether or not a violation is sustained and for how long someone is held, it is an administrative law judge. The administrative law judges that we appear in front of are employed by the prison system by New York State docs. They work for the same agency that parole officers um, work for essentially. Um, so in every way, it feels like the odds are stacked against our client. Um, the, the struggle is enormous to try to get clients released and to try to really get them um, a fair process. Thank you so much. Uh, we're gonna turn in a second to hear a bit more about the Less is More Act, which is a proposal for the state legislature to reform this in Kenyatta. I hope you'll be able to fill us in on that in a moment. But before I do, I just wanted to go back to Vinny for a minute, because Vinny, you faced a lot of these same issues and systems when you ran the probation department in New York City. And you know, probation and parole are slightly different, but just curious about how you chose to address, address these issues when you were in charge of that department. You know, there's an enormous amount of discretion available to department heads. And so, you know, we work with my staff to get them to substantially reduce technical violations. It was a 45% reduction. I know Commissioner Bermudez has reduced it further as we've looked for data about the number of people in Rikers for a technical violation. I've looked at um, probation and typically there is no one in on a pure tech, literally no one out of 15,000 people on probation. Doesn't mean somebody's not in there on probation with another arrest, but not for just a pure technical. And on the, on the flip side, we wanted to encourage people to engage in good behavior. So we, we said, all right, well, if, you know, if you're behaving well and you're doing well, we will go back to the judge and ask for an early discharge. So we inc increased that almost fivefold when we had the state do an analysis about it, uh, it showed that the people got, who got discharged early actually had lower rearrest rates than the people who stayed on for the full term of probation. Because it shouldn't be just about time. It should be about what's going on. And if, if the purpose of this is to help people turn their lives around, why is it like a set amount of time? Why isn't it the better you do, the quicker it's over? Uh, so that we stop focusing on people who don't need to be supervised, which just sets up tripwires for them to screw up on something small, like Laura just described, and go back to the jail or prison. Stop focusing on them. Get them out of here. Don't put POs in the position where if somebody misses an appointment and they don't really think that person's going to be a problem, but now, as, as Dr. Seward says, I got to worry about whether I file a revocation on this person or not. And if I don't, maybe they'll do something wrong and I'm, I'm in trouble. But just get them off probation. So that's what we did. We increased it five folds and the judges went along with it. And so we did a lot of things like that. Then what happened is the population got so small that we were able to capture money 
uh, savings and put them into programs. So we hired actually a lot of organizations who had formerly incarcerated people mentor, particularly the younger people on probation, 16 to 25 year olds, uh, in a program called Arches. A lot of small contracts were issued for that. And again, that showed substantial reductions in recidivism. The Urban Institute did an analysis of it because these young men and women kind of saw the older folks who had walked in their shoes as mentors and, and role models in a lot of ways, because now these other folks were, you know, like Donna, like Wesley, they had turned their lives around. They could see some hope. They could see, oh, maybe I'll become like Donna. Maybe I'll become like Wesley. Uh, so uh, as you shrink it, uh, you know, we shouldn't just dump the money into the Atlantic Ocean. We should capture those monies, those savings, as, as Donna mentioned, and start to reinvest them in neighborhoods that are heavily impacted by, um, by supervision. And that's what we did. We, we opened up 14 offices in the 14 neighborhoods in New York City that had the most people on probation and parole. And we put lots of services in that we ran through contracts with nonprofits rather than just by ourselves. Thank you. Uh, so, so Kenyatta, can you talk about how Less Is More would kind of pull together these different pieces of the system, look at these different pieces of the system, and what would it do to change it? Absolutely. But before I do that, I think it's important to name that we've all been skirting around these like few words that are describing the system. So we just have to name that the parole system is incredibly racist and it's incredibly classist. I think we've talked about it enough. And um, I believe it was Wesley, you mentioned just how the system is set up and it's flawed. And I wanted to just name that the people that we're seeing locked up and incarcerated for these technical parole violations, they are poor people. They are Black people. They are other people of color. They are queer people. They are people who live in areas where the transportation isn't adequate. And so they can't always make it to their appointments. And so they're running a few minutes late. And so it's important for us to just name how deeply racist and classist the system is in order for us to actually change it. Um, and so Less is More New York, which is sponsored by Senator Brian Benjamin, uh, bill number S1144 in the Senate, and then Assembly Member Farrah Forrest, Farrah Soufant Forrest, um, 5576 in the assembly has four main provisions to address some of the different pieces of the parole system that the other panelists mentioned. And so I wanted to go through just those different four, uh, those four provisions so that everyone had an understanding of what it would do. And so the first thing it would do is actually restrict the use of incarceration for technical parole violations. And so that's really important because as the other panelists have stated, Laura talked about her clients who have been impacted by this um, Donna talked specifically about her friend who had a minor parole violation. Restricting that use of incarceration would ensure that people aren't just ending up back into the system for these minor non-criminal violations. And so the second thing it would do is it would bolster due process. And so it was mentioned earlier how an individual can stay inside, um, and Laura mentioned it, how they, um, once they have this alleged technical parole violation, they just immediately go to Rikers Island if they're in New York City or being held in a local jail in their municipality. Um, what Less Is More New York would do would ensure that people are no longer just immediately detained. And that would help people just stay safe and stay in their communities. Um, we have members at Catal who have been impacted by the parole system. And just because of an alleged technical parole violation, they're thrown back in incarceration. That's not actually keeping our communities safer. What'll keep our communities safer is keeping our communities together. And so bolstering due process would help to keep our communities together and take away the power that parole has right now, which is just throwing people in incarceration. The third thing Less Is More New York would do is it would provide speedy hearings. This way folks who are incarcerated or um, for an alleged technical parole violation, it would speed up the process that they would have to get their hearing. Um, and we actually have a member of Catal who spent a year inside um, just waiting and so we got to make sure that individuals are able to actually get their hearings of their alleged technical parole violations rather than just wasting away for weeks or potentially even months. And then the last thing that Less Is More New York would do is it would provide earned time credits. And so every 30 days a person does well on parole without getting another violation, they would get 30 days off the back end of their parole sentence. And so that could effectively ensure that people get off parole quicker as long as they don't get any more violations. And again, thinking about the first provision, restricting the use of incarceration for technicals, um, this would ensure that we are just making it so that 
individuals are off parole quicker. And so those are the four main provisions of Less is More New York. And that's how um, this bill would radically transform the parole system. And can you tell us a little bit about who's supporting the bill and also who, who's opposing it right now? Okay, so we have a number of different individuals and organizations who've supported the bill. So presently right now we have nearly uh, 240 groups that have supported it. Um, and we have outside of just groups that have supported it. Um, many of those groups, by the way, they are local to New York and some are even national, um, including EXIT, which is a group of corrections and community supervision um, individuals throughout the country. And so that's a really, it's really great to have them signed on to the bill because I think they recognize the need to actually transform the parole system. Um, and so outside of the groups that have signed on, we have a number of different elected officials throughout the state who have signed on, including seven district attorneys, a number of sheriffs throughout the state, um, and other elected officials who support the bill. So it is a wide reaching bill. And I think people are finally waking up to how necessary it is for New York to not be behind the rest of the country when it comes to the parole system. Like we're lagging behind the rest of the state. And the support that we have for Less is More New York just shows how needed it is for New York to transform its parole system. And to you, actually, I'll maybe just turn to Dr. Seward on this one. In terms of arguments against this type of reform, as somebody who worked within the parole system, what are some of the contentions, the people who oppose this bill, and how would you respond to them? Well, I, I think, can you hear me? Yes, I, I think the first thing I always look to ask is, do you have all the right information? Because I think a lot of times people make decisions on misinformation. I think the other issue usually is, a lot of politicians, not all, always use, as somebody mentioned um, earlier, that containing this group of individuals enhances public safety. And I think as long as you use a public safety phrase, a slogan, or any verbiage around public safety, no one's going to argue that. However, no one's going to question, what do you mean by that? And I think that it's very difficult for the politicians to wrap their head around this because they think it means that they're being soft on crime. And I don't think they realize that this population that we are speaking of is not the population that's contributing to the increase in the crime rates anyway. If anything, they are contributing toward um, community safety because what you will see is a lot of people who are coming home from prison, especially long-term incarceration, they are not willing to be in an environment you know, that's like the okay corral. They're not trying to be in a building where they don't feel safe coming in and out. So if anything, they're giving back to their communities by helping, as I think that was um, Vincent said, like the um, Arches program, becoming mentors for the young people who may be considered menace of these communities to help empower the community. So I think for a lot of the politicians, it's really misinformation um, it's the um, trying to, you know, the impression of they're being soft on crime. And then the other piece is, you know, we have to understand that there's a union here too, you know, and these union members are also parole officers who are also living in these various um, areas that some of these politicians that are against this. So they're not going to, you know, um, want to support something that may have many of their constituents um, unemployed because once again, they don't understand that this bill is not about making parole officers or parole staff unemployed. It's really about getting parole staff to reorganize uh, and revisit the way in which they do community supervision. But once again, um, Zach, I think it goes back to they're not willing to hear thoroughly because of fear of what their constituents would say, as well as they're not really giving 
their constituents the correct information so that their constituents can make sound decisions. That's my my thought about it. Thank you. Can I just throw out one other one other issue that, that sometimes parole officers have raised? in response to legislation. One particular thing they worry about is people absconding from parole. So when people aren't coming to the meet the office with a parole officer, the officer may lose touch with them. And that's a, a big concern of parole officers. If they don't know where somebody is, they don't, they don't know what they're up to. And, and their concern is if they don't have the threat of incarceration, that uh, they will, you know, this may become an even bigger problem where they won't have an opportunity to resolve it. How, how would you respond to that? A person who's going to abscond is going to abscond. Prison is not a deterrent for anybody who's already been there. It's just a matter of getting back in the flow, knowing how to, you know, duck and weave and do what you do. Um, so that's not a deterrent. That's not a deterrent at all. I think that if we look at who absconds, there are signs and symptoms usually early on of who's going to abscond. And I think if they really think about this as it, the bill is mapped out, if you don't entertain, so to speak, the low hanging fruit, you'll be able to spend more time on those who need more engagement and more services from the parole staff. Keeping, so doing, you know, running behind somebody who has a dirty urine or who missed curfew or, you know, stayed at the girlfriend's house two nights why are you running behind them, especially if they have a job, um, they've been no, po you know, no positive toxicologies for the most part, they haven't been a problem. You're worrying about that one over there when you should be worrying about the one that you think is getting ready to run on you. And as Donna, I think mentioned, <clears throat> with the caseloads being so high, especially now because all of the um, um, staff shortages they have, how do you, do a division of labor and how do you pr prioritize your, your time with your caseload if one, you don't feel like you have the support that you need from your superiors for one, and two, they have you running behind people who don't need to be ran behind. That makes no sense. And if you look at the absconder rate and you look at at what point in time people abscond and if there was a way to try to figure out at what point in time did they start giving the signs and, and, and signals to the PO or to the family member that they were a little off balance? You'll see, you know, um, it's almost like the concept of relapse. People relapse mentally first before they actually pick up the drug. And I think when you think of an absconder, there's a plan that has already been put in place and you see the signs. So instead of you worrying about the one who's been doing everything right, that may have one or two questionable actions, I think you should be taking that group. I'm not saying you should not um, hold them accountable, but accountability does not mean incarceration and ruining people's lives. And then you come back to the table and want to talk about absconders because at the end of the day, an absconder is an absconder. An absconder doesn't have to go into this category of technical violations per se. And then if they look, some of the absconders, you know, and many of you who've been around for the last six, nine months, we've had a, 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 a gentleman who's very active in the advocacy community that was mis listed as an absconder and he wasn't an absconder. He changed the address, they changed POs and God forbid somebody went in the system and looked to see that he had an approval to go to the next address, but they had him down in the absconder. He was sitting at, in, 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 in the violation process for a couple of months until somebody decided to really look at the paperwork and said he didn't abscond, the PO didn't go check the new, the, the new address. Meanwhile, the OPO tell him he can go. So, you know, we got to also kind of define it and double check what really is an absconder because a PO not doing his or her job and you, you don't, you know, and then when somebody, you know, comes, brings it to their attention, that doesn't mean the person absconded. That means you didn't do your job. But if they would have looked at this young man's background and realized he was reporting, he was calling, he was doing everything he was supposed to do, he didn't fall off the radar. How about you call him on the phone? He didn't change his phone number either, but he was considered an absconder. So I would even question 
their legitimacy to what is who's absconded did they really abscond or did your po not do their work and it's easier to check abscond just like it's easier to do a technical violation than it is for you to sit down and, and, and try to put the pieces together so um what i would say to the legislature you really need to understand that this is a system that's been flawed for years and it's a system that nobody really micromanages the day-to-day -day coming and going of the parole management, management. That's what I say. And, and if I may jump in briefly on this, this system is a contradiction. It's a system that bullies those who were placed into it from the moment of arrest to, you know, Laura mentioned the use of bail as an incentive to people pleading out to get out of the system. The use of bail to get people to cop out and go to state prison is a bullying structure. You get to prison, it's a bullying structure, right? All the while we're trying to impart on those who are going through the system that we need to be kinder, gentler, more community-minded, civic-minded beings. And those of us who comes out as such, comes out as such in spite of, not because the system was conducive to us transforming. What happens and what we need to look at when you talk about those who abscound, look at the vast majority of those who choose to abscound. For those of you who have never been to a parole location to report, whether it's weekly or monthly or whatever the cycle is, it is atrocious. It is literally like walking into a, a, a kindergarten with staff who are corrections officers now, right? Literally treating the men and women who are reporting, who are self-reporting as per required, as if they were two years old. The, the, the way they speak to them, the way they engage them, the fact that you sometimes sit around for four, five, six hours without any consideration for the fact that you have family obligations, you may have had to pick up your children or drop them off to school, you have employment responsibilities. And at some point, some people just say, F it and walk away, right? And I think the question has to be asked, what would make someone who has otherwise engaged in the system in a way that we ask civically that we live up to our responsibility to all of us by participating in, in this contract that, that none of us have signed off on, but we adhere to, why someone would walk away from that? Why someone would say, I've had enough? And I think if we examine that, we will see that the system is bullying and sometimes people just have enough. I think, can I, Zach, you have a second? Yeah. Okay, so I wanna jump in on that because that is that is so real and it's so real right now, right? It's so, I mean, you can just, it's so tangible. So imagine for those that who are listening to us who don't really understand what we're saying, imagine going into an area going to report you're doing your duty you're going to report you're following the mandate to go report and you know you have work right you might work the three to eleven shift somewhere and so you get to parole nine o'clock in the morning when they open nine o'clock in the morning and you let them know when you get there i am here to report early because i have to get into work by three o'clock right that's my that's my shift and so maliciously maliciously a parole maliciously i've watched it I have watched it, has said that they're not going to call that person. Who do they think they are? So I don't care if they're working. I've heard them say this. I used to work, do things for parole. I've heard, I used to be there so I can, um, you know, outreach so I can help support people that are coming out. I've heard them say this. So what that they're working? And so a person has to now choose to sit there and wait until the parole officer now feels like calling them to finish their parole, pro to the, the um, reporting process or leave so they can make it to work. Because if they lose that job, if they lose that job for not getting there for their shift, that is a reason to violate them because they didn't maintain employment. But then also the catch 22 is they left parole. So they also, some I've heard some people say, well, they absconded. 
because they didn't report, but knowing full well the person signed in and was waiting there for hours. So these are the tricky things that we're put in. These boxes, these things that we're placed in. No, it's not every parole officer, but one is too much. One is too much. And I can count on two hands, my personal uh, witnessing that this has happened. And so that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to stop these things from continuing to happen. People, I spent almost three decades inside. I just wanted to come out and live a life give back the way I can. I could never change the past, but I could do something, contribute now and make my community safer because that is where our minds are at. That is who we are. We're not monsters to um, Dr. Seward's point. We're not those people that are causing crimes and rise and having crimes rise. Like we're not bringing guns in our communities. We're not flooding our communities with drugs. We're not doing these things. We're trying to clean them up. And this is why this is so important. Thanks. Of course. We're going to turn to audience questions in a moment. Kenyatta, I just was hoping maybe before we do, if you could say if, if someone is interested in learning more, getting involved in this, what would be the best route forward? For? The best thing and the best way that people can get involved would be to check out our website, lessismoreny.org. There you'll find, uh, you'll find the ability where you can actually take immediate action online and just reach out to your elected officials. And I'll drop the link so that individuals can do that. And it's really quick. You can um, just sign, put your information in, including your address, and it will automatically populate a form email that you can edit yourself, but you can then send that on to your elected official and ask them to sign on to Less Is More New York. And even more, um, on Thursday, March 25th, from 2.30 to 3.30 p.m., we'll actually have a Less Is More New York statewide campaign update call where members of the Less Is More New York Executive Committee and other partners will be able to share some of the latest updates on Less Is More New York. And so those are two really quick ways that if anybody's listening in on this call and they want to take action, you can do so. So I'll make sure to put that information in the chat and we can also get that wrapped up um, in the follow-up if that's available. I am a complete idiot when it comes to stuff like this. This is the easiest website in the world to navigate. It's great, and it sends a letter out just like that. Thank you, thank you, everybody. Uh, Greg, we turn to you for some questions now, please. Okay, great. Thank you so much, everybody. And uh, everybody in the audience, please keep the questions coming in the Q&A box. Uh, we already have some great questions. Um, so we have a question about what, you know, the cost of incarcerating so many people for technical parole violations. And uh, there was a report today from the Justice Lab and uh, more just NYC where Vinny and Zachary both work, um, putting the, estimating the cost at close to $700 million. Um, and, you know, the question is, what are the uh, legal obstacles um, to actually reinvesting that money in the community if the less is more act were to pass and the state were to save money on incarcerating people for technical parole violations. Um, and is there any way to get around them? So, uh, well, uh, Zachary, would you mind? Uh, I know you're the moderator, but... Uh, <laughs> Uh, Zachary and Vinny, would you mind uh, addressing that? And if anybody else has any thoughts, please chime in. Uh, sure, I'll, I'll briefly start just talking about the, the, what the report found, what we found, and Vinny may have turned to you about community reinvestment. Um, so, so we analyzed together with the, at the Lipman Commission where I work uh, with the Columbia Justice Lab, analyzed how much the New York State spends to imprison people for technical parole violations, how much the counties spend uh, to jail people who are accused of violation because as Laura said earlier, if someone's accused of a violation, they're automatically sent to jail, they're sent to the local county jail. And the way it works in New York State is that those counties have to bear the entire cost of that incarceration, even though they, they have no say whatsoever in whether or not somebody is actually locked up in their jails. The state parole authorities decide that, but the counties jail them and pay for it pending someone's hearing, which can, can take months. Uh, and so during that time, we looked at, at, at the state level, New York State, and if they're sent back to prison after being found to have committed a violation, the state takes over and sends them to prison. The state spends $319 million a year 
at least, uh, to incarcerate people for these technical parole violations. In New York City, New York City, in the five boroughs in New York City, New York City spends over $270 million a year to lock people up in jail. You know, money that we don't have any say in whether we spend or not um, as a city. And counties outside of New York City spend over $90 million a year locking people up in, for parole violations in their jails. And so this is, you know, grand total of $683 million a year. And that is probably, frankly, an understatement, an underestimate, because there's some pension funds and fringe benefit costs that are buried in other parts of the budget that are sort of difficult to pull out and isolate just for corrections. But a minimum of $683 million a year that our state and counties and cities spends on incarcerating people for these technical rules violations of parole. And Vinny, will you talk a little bit about please about the investment piece. Yeah, you know, just one thing that just to pull a camera back a little bit. I mean, you know, the the whole movement towards mass incarceration that started in the 70s, it was it didn't happen in isolation as Kenyatta talked about it was it was part of a very deliberate effort to racialize poverty and crime issues without using the words race and and black and African-American, right? And so instead of using those words, you could talk about crime, you could talk about poverty. And it was a deliberate strategy started in the 70s. And so as mass incarceration was mushrooming, uh, the, the supports for uh, poor people, people in inner city communities who were disproportionately people of color were evaporating, they were going away. They were going away in general, and were very specifically going away for people involved in the criminal justice system, can't live in public housing, can't work in certain places, can't get licenses to do certain things, can't vote. Uh, and so um, the hope, and, and, and this had, it was terribly disintegrative for a lot of communities. So as we look to dismantle mass incarceration, we shouldn't be thinking dump 2.2 million people onto neighborhoods that are already stressed out and under-resourced. We need to move money along with people, move resources, and it needs to go back to the neighborhoods where those people are from, where the people under supervision live so that their communities can be nurturing places that can welcome them back home. And so that's really the second part of the paper. And it's not an exhaustive list, but it looks at kind of ideas that people have around the country, the Colorado Criminal Justice Coalition has done some great work. They've gotten $80 million from the corrections budget to go back to Colorado communities. And the communities themselves have working groups that figure out how those dollars are get spent. And some of them are direct help to people that come out, but some of them are just ways to make the community better places. So like microloans to people in heavily stressed out neighborhoods where they can start businesses, things like that other end of the, on a different kind of the spectrum. There's this program I love that's just about to start from the Osborne Association, Kinship Reentry. Women bear the biggest part of the burden of welcoming people back home from prison, mothers, sisters, girlfriends, wives. That's who's doing that work. But when you never give them resources or money, we give it to halfway houses, we give it to anybody but them. And so the Osborne Association has created this program that's just about to start this month called Kinship Reentry, where if someone's got someone coming home, but they don't have an extra bedroom, they can get $500 and move in apartments so that they have a, a bedroom for that person. They can have some case management and some employment help. They can have, you know, formerly incarcerated person help them navigate their way back home. Those are just two examples. And we pluck maybe 10 or so examples. But that, let me give you that as one example. That costs about $10,000 a year, kinship reentry. Half of everybody being paroled to New York City, a little more than half, is paroled to a homeless shelter, which is a place you go to fail when you come out of prison, right? That's about 4,200 people. If we bought every single one of them, $10,000 worth of kinship reentry. I'm not saying they all would need it and that's all appropriate, but let's imagine we just did. That's $42, uh, $42 million. No, we didn't spend that $42 million to house those people. We spent $273 million 
to put them in Rikers Island. That doesn't even include the 300 plus million we spent at the state level. So as POs are in incredibly stressed out work and some of them are jerks and some of them are heroes and a whole bunch of them are just regular people right in the middle, right? Like all the rest of us. They have a ton of people with a ton of problems in a society that thinks very poorly of people coming out of prison that they're juggling right now. And do they have $79,000 to help somebody get a job or to house somebody? Nope. But with a stroke of a pen, they can spend $79,000 to send somebody back to state prison. So it should surprise no one that they do that with alarming frequency. And so what we need to do is we need to reverse that. The money has to follow the people. The resources has to follow the people. Those folks are, there. a lot of people coming out of prison, they're hurting and they need help. That's the bad news. The good news is we as a society are willing to spend $680 million on them. But the bad news is we're spending it in a very stupid and destructive and as Kenyatta pointed out, racist way. Uh, and we need to reverse that. Can I just add to that really quick? I think one of the things also is in that 683 million, people need to realize that they're sitting in jails and prisons, not getting any services or programs to correct the behavior that they claim was the result of the technical violation. So it's not like they're sitting there being corrected in the correctional facility. That's not happening. They are sitting there watching the TV that you see on some of the TV shows, um, going to the, you know, child. There is no programming because they say at the Rikers level, they're not there long enough to fit into the cycle of the programming. And when they're in the state prison, they have a hard enough time trying to make sure those who are getting ready to go to the board within the next six to nine months and making sure they have adequate programming that they cannot fit these individuals um, into the everyday streaming of programming through the program committee. They don't even have them usually on work details. They do absolutely nothing. They are sitting in a, in a jail or a prison, just jailing it. They're not getting any empowerment sessions. Um, they're no programming. They don't even, unless they're an adolescent, they will not even be able to go into the educational program um, in order to, let's say, enhance their knowledge or if they don't have the GED or whatever. So if they're a pro violator, they're sitting there jailing it and they're not getting any assistance to correct the behavior. So we had a question about uh, sort of the collateral consequences of somebody on parole being incarcerated uh, while they're accused of a technical parole violation, um, whether or not they're ultimately convicted of it. Uh, and in particular, the effects on women who are under parole supervision, and if there's any uh, particular issues and impacts that uh, women face when they're under parole supervision. So I wanted to start with Laura, and actually if you could just, uh, you know, part of the question is how long do you find that people are incarcerated for technical parole violations, depending on both if they are ultimately uh, the violation sustained or even if it's not, but they're incarcerated while it's adjudicated. And uh, in terms of your clients, what, what kind of issues have you um, observed with women and the effects of being incarcerated? And then we'll also ask some of the other panelists after that. Um, yes, well, anybody can that is accused of a violation, whether it be technical or a criminal type of violation, can be held for up to 90 days um, until their case is adjudicated. Sometimes that time period of 90 days is extended. Um, if, as defense, we take an adjournment to provide mitigation to the court, maybe put together an inpatient program, something like that. Um, but the collateral, collateral consequences are huge for, for really anyone who, who's incarcerated. And you know, maybe I could let Donna specifically speak to women because I, I know she works specifically with women. Um, but I mean, I just have so, so many stories of clients, their lives being completely upended um, when they're in custody, whether or not you know, they had something, say they had a car. Even if they're in custody 30 days, they, they missed a car payment, they probably lost their job. 
I recently represented someone um, who was working at a building maintenance company and he was using up his vacation time and his sick time to be incarcerated. Meanwhile, he was late on his rent, he was late on his car payment, he had children outside. These are huge consequences that people face. Um, and, and sometimes parole doesn't even let people get to that point where they, they have enough of a life to have things like a job. I mean, just from the, from the get-go, um, our office has represented someone, I know that he's spoken publicly to the media, Sean Dunn. Since 2017, he's been um, violated seven times for technical violations. When he came out, he was working at a bakery, he was working for Summer Stage, he's just repeatedly violated. Some of these cases were thrown out at a pre preliminary hearing because they were so ridiculous. Um, but as he put it, you know, the times that he worked and had a job were, were really where he felt so much self-worth, like he could provide for himself. And for so long, he had been missing that in his life. Um, so if the purpose of parole is to have people make, make a successful re-entry into society, then you, you can't incarcerate your way into that, that being the end goal. Um, and, and really, it does appear that, and, and see every day that that is what parole is doing. Um, you know, in my work, um, I mostly represent men, unfortunately, that, that are in this process. Um, however, I know that women routinely come into this process. Um, so I, I will let Donna sp speak to that. I have to say this for our answer. Unfortunately, I hear that so much and it just still hurts my heart. And I guess this is why I'm doing this work because we do see men being so represented and women continue not to be as represented as much. But I'll tell you what women lose. Women are usually like 90% of um, women that are incarcerated are mothers, right? They have a child or children. And so when they come out, they're trying to get their family dynamic back together, right? Reconnect with their children, find their children if they're in the system or child or a person had the child, another um, family member. It's kind of difficult, that process, right? And so you have to um, work that process through and say, you finally found a job, you found housing, now you have your child or children back, and then you're facing a violation and you're sitting on Rikers Island or whatever county uh, for whatever, 90 days. I wouldn't care if it's 15 days, right? Now you're sitting there, what happens to your children? When you go, when, when you go in for a violation, you go to a parole office to report and then the cuffs go immediately on. Let's say you might have had your child or children outside because you can't bring them inside the parole office with you, right? And so now what happens to the children? Are they put back into the system? Is there someone there for them? You know, who gets to um, take them? And what happens now? And so that's what we face a lot as women, not all women, but the vast majority of women have children. But then also just women, once you arrest a woman, you're, you just, you're basically tearing apart a family. Right, women are oftentimes the primary, primary caregiver of a family. And so when you arrest a, a mother, a woman, you're separating, you're tearing apart a family and you're tearing apart communities. And so that in itself, we have to look at that. Why do we, can, why do we see a rise in the incarceration of women? Why we continue to see a rise in the incarceration of women in the last 30 um, years, right? The, the rate in which women are being incarcerated is crazy. And so we have to look at that as well and stop that and stop continuing that process of technical violations which continues that tearing families and communities apart. So women who are least represented and most and, and under uh, resourced are the ones that are hit oftentimes the hardest because you lose so much more. You lose in that family dynamic. Men respond to prison and the system differently than women. Let's be very clear. Men respond to the process differently and are treated differently, are treated differently. Even from instant offense, men will be offered plea deals and, and, and treated differently as they go through the, um, the, 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 system, the judicial process, as opposed to women. As opposed to women, we have grandmothers that are sitting in prison now because of something that you know happened <laughs> in their home and they didn't know anything about it. So what about that grandmother who's now coming out, trying to find her way? What happens with her if she's facing a violation? We're not thinking about elderly people who come out eventually, right? And they're facing some kind of violation for not committing a crime. We're not looking at that. We're not looking at health disparities. We're not looking at the overall health of a woman that there was a problem anyway and the woman was self-medicating because she couldn't afford it, couldn't get on this. I mean, the system doesn't take care of you so well. We talk about dental care, mental health care and all these other things within these communities. 
that are hardest hit, let's put the money back into the communities. Let's take that over $10 billion within a decade and put in the community, 680 something million dollars a year. Give it to the, give it to the community. Women get hit the hardest because we don't get the resources that we need. We're not even talking about housing. We're not even talking about how there's hard, not that much housing for women to begin with when they come out. That's why I'm fighting so hard to create another uh, housing program under my organization because there's not enough. There's just not enough. And I have to say, we had a woman that was facing reincarceration, and this is on a federal level, but we have to say it mirrors, right? State during this time of COVID and trying to find her housing, I couldn't get an organization, my colleague and I couldn't get an organization to just give her a bed so she wouldn't be sent back to federal prison. It's the same thing that happens on the state level and even on the local level. So we have to be very clear that women need some more resources here. Some of that money could be utilized greatly for women. And uh, Kenyatta, you were talking earlier about kind of the long list of organizations and politicians who are supporting the Less Is More Act. Are there any district attorneys or uh, politicians who actively oppose the bill? And what are the reasons that they give if they do so? Got to say, you threw me for a loop there. I thought you were going to say who support the bill. So any politicians or elected officials who actively oppose the bill and what they're saying. I think I'll just hit what they're saying. A lot of people are conflating what has happened previously. And I know bail reform was mentioned earlier, but I think a lot of, especially elected officials will conflate what um, they perceive as negative impact from bail reform which let's also be clear, there are, there are, there, that in and of itself is like a false perception that they conflate what happened, what they perceive as a negative impact with bail reform, with bills and progressive criminal justice reform measures like Less Is More New York. And so like the other panelists have stated, that is not what Less Is More New York is about. And it'll actually help support our communities and support our people better. I mean, I know that there was a question also in the Q&A that Vinny answered, but I wanted to answer it publicly here just about the number of district attorneys who also support Less Is More New York. Um, and I'll just go through the list. Eric Gonzalez in Brooklyn, David Soares in Albany County, Cy Vance in Manhattan, Darcel Clark in the Bronx, Matthew Van Houten in Tompkins County, David Clegg in Ulster County, and Mimi Roca in Westchester County. I echo their names just because these are elected officials who recognize the importance of transforming the parole system and the importance of bills like Less is More New York. And so those elected officials who are listening to the fodder really need to pay attention to what's happening and how that's impacting their constituents because their constituents have spoken and their colleagues have spoken and that Less is More New York is necessary. And we, uh, we touched a bit on other jurisdictions experience with changing post-release supervision, particularly Vinny's experience in New York City. Um, are there any other jurisdictions outside of New York, other states or cities that have had experience in acting reform similar to the Less is More Act? And how has that gone? And that's for anybody who can address it. Yeah, I, I can take on some of that. Um, and Vinny, feel free to Feel free to jump in, but there are other states in the, in, the, in the United States who have actually adopted similar sanctions. South Carolina did a graduated sanctions and they found that their recidivism um, rates, their crime rates actually dropped by a third. Um, Louisiana implemented caps on prison and jail sentences for first time people with technical parole violations and 22% fewer people under community supervision were sent back for new crimes. And so if we even just look in, this, in the United States itself, these measures have worked in other jurisdictions, but New York still lags behind. So I'll kick it to you, Vinny, if you wanted to add on to that. I always for, almost forget to unmute. Um, yeah, that was a good list. Uh, just a, a different way of putting it too is that some states and jurisdictions have also massively reduced the number of people under supervision uh, with no negative impact. So California, actually has reduced the number of people on probation and parole by 150,000 people in between 2007 and 2018 through a series of ballot initiatives and uh, bills. And just this year, Governor Newsom 
put into legislation in his own budget, reducing parole supervision to two years. And it was a separate bill for probation that reduced probation supervision to two years for people convicted of felonies and one year to, for people convicted of misdemeanors. Uh, so that 150,000 uh, person reduction of supervision doesn't even include that new legislation. Uh, California's crime rate dropped by 29% during that uh, 11 year period from 2007 to 2018. Here in New York City, there's been an over an 80% reduction in number of people on probation from mm -hmm. over 80,000 people in the mid nineties, it's slightly under 14,000 today. Uh, and you know, there's been record declines in crime in New York City. Homicides alone went from 2,200 to below 300 before the pandemic. And, you know, remember probation and parole were started as ways to reduce the you know, rehabilitative ways to reduce the number of people that got locked up. So did eliminating all of that uh, uh, proba parole and probation in New York and California increase incarceration? Nope. Uh, in New York, Rikers population dropped, DOC city jails dropped from 2,200 to a little over 5,000 now. California, there was a one-third decline in the number of people in prison. So less people under supervision has coincided with less crime and fewer people incarcerated. All right, uh, I think we just have time for one last question. Uh, I think it's a good one to help people kind of understand the scope of the issue here. Uh, does anybody have a sense of what the most common uh, parole violation, technical parole violations are in New York that are commonly charged? We did an analysis with legal aid and it showed absconding and uh, drug use were the top two. I don't know what the third one was, but they were, they were big ones. And, you know, I want to just sort of add to something Dr. Seward said, which is that in my view, the punitiveness of the environment and parole actually contributes to absconding because people are afraid they're going to get locked up. So I, I know that the department believes the more punitive they are, the more they're going to scare people into compliance. I actually think it's exactly the opposite. Yes, I think that Oh, sorry, I was just going to say, I think that the most common violation or technical violation that we see is, is failure to report or so-called absconding. But I think a lot of that is, is fear. You know, when, when I'm speaking to clients, what I hear is that they're afraid of being locked up. Every time they're like buzzed into a parole lock, that fear hits them. And that could be a day that they don't see the outside. They're taken right to Rikers. So I think that fear plays a big part in it. If, if some of that fear were taken out of the equation by taking out by taking away some of the parole officer's discretion and power and empowering people rather than making them fearful just as they are in an in a carceral um, state or, or um, institution, then I think it would really um, sort of push people to be more successful, obviously, than they are now. Sorry, Donna. No, that was some of what I was going to say, but I want to be clear as well. Um, in a time now in this country where we hear the cries of, uh, we have a public health crisis because of the drug, um, right, overdoses that's happening and because of the communities that it's hitting now, right, it's always hit them, but now it's such a, it's more um, in our face. And so if we have a public health crisis going on for certain individuals, then why are we sending people back to prison, reincarcerating them for that same issue? So it's kind of, right, it's either the, 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 the oxymoronic um, thing in there, you know, how is one set of people they need help and it's a public health crisis, so let's get them the help. But people that are happen to be on parole, oh, they're not good. They're not um, good enough for that kind of help. They need to be reincarcerated, right? They have to go back to prison that does not do anything for drug abuse, right? Not even drug abuse, substance um, issues at all, right? We have to look at root causes. We have to look at root causes. And so that's why people are going to not report because you know that you're going to face a violation and be taken back to prison and everything you've done. Somebody goes out and they're, Tavonda said this um, a little earlier, they might have hung out with their girlfriends a little longer or whatever, and they might've had a few drinks, right? And that was the drink, you might've had to give urine. And for some reason, it's, you know, you, you didn't, 
it didn't excrete out of your body fast enough overnight. So you're afraid to go in, right? Oh my God, I hung out and I was having fun, not hurting anyone, right? But I can't go to parole right now and report because I'm scared to death that, you know, all this wine or whatever I drank might not be out my system or whatever else, even if I had some marijuana, right? Which is now legal in certain aspects, legal, but a person is still being sent back to prison for it. So it just makes no sense. Well, I think, I think to add to the drug treatment piece also, a lot of OASIS programs are not just taking people with marijuana use. You have to have something else. That's one thing. The other thing is that in 2007, 2008, parole got rid of all their contract drug programs saying that they didn't need to pay for extra services because the state OASIS um, programs were handling that. They also dismantled their access program that when I first came on board in 2009 was a program designed to help parole staff um, appropriately treatment match individuals. They took those individuals and meshed them into the um, reentry program where it's now about just finding regular programs as a whole. There's no focal point on having KSAT eligible staff, um, or I should say KSAT trained staff that work in parole that appropriately treatment match people. So it, it, it doesn't surprise me that you have a lot of technical violations for, for drug problems because you don't have anybody that's on the premises that's specializing in appropriate treatment matching instead of just sending them to the program that the PO likes because when they come in, they can just stop at the desk and get the update. So I think that, you know, it's not surprising. You don't have services in place for those who have these substance abuse and mental health issues. How do you expect them to deal with the system? It's evident that eventually they're going to fall, you know, off a little bit. But as it said, incarceration is not going to help that because what they, they get to go to the NA meeting and the AA meeting. They can do that in the community if need be with a GPS on. They don't need to be locked behind the, 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 the walls. That makes no sense. All right. Well, we are out of time. There's still, there's so much more we could discuss, but it's been a really great discussion about this important issue. I certainly learned a lot and I think there's a lot of great information. Thank you so much to all the panelists. Everybody here is very busy and very accomplished. So we really appreciate you taking the time to speak with everybody tonight. Thank you everybody in the audience for tuning in. Thanks to the City Bar and all our co-sponsoring organizations. And there's uh, a lot of links in the chat feature for anybody to learn more and engage more with this issue. Thank you, everybody. Good night.